All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Okay, this review made me laugh. A breath of fresh air. Thank you for all your wonderful content and for allowing your guests to actually speak. So many podcasters talk over their guests and you actually let your guests teach the audience. Thank you. You are so welcome, Megan, and hopefully today's guest is no exception. David Minkoff is a doctor who's gonna teach us all about nitrogen utilization, how protein is digested, absorbed, and metabolized, and what the best sources are when it comes to bioavailability. It was eye-opening to say the least, and it makes me even more proud that my grass-fed beef protein is a complete protein with all the essential amino acids plus all the collagen amino acids for the best bioavailable protein on the market. So um, there is my shameless plug. Thank you for your review, and I'm so excited for you to learn from David Minkoff. Let's get to the show. All right, guys, welcome back to the show. Today's guest is Dr. Minkoff. He founded LifeWorks Wellness Center in 1997, now one of the largest alternative medical clinics in the US, and Body Health in 2000, a nutrition company offering a unique range of dietary supplements for the public and practitioners. Dr. Minkoff has a diverse background as a board certified pediatrician, a fellow in infectious disease, an ER physician, and as the co-director of the neonatal intensive care unit. He is an expert in hormone replacement, functional medicine, chelation, allergy elimination, European biological medicine, neural therapy, ozone therapy, longevity, uh, the list goes on and on here. Dr. Minkoff is passionate about fitness, and at 71, he completed his 43rd full Ironman triathlon and is qualified for the Kona World Championship eight times. When he's not training, he devotes his time to his wife of 50 years, their three children, and eight grandchildren, while also writing and researching. He recently wrote the best-selling book, The Search for the Perfect Protein, which was sent to me in January, and I read the book in in an evening. (laughs) I could not put it down, and um, I I was joking with him before we started that it definitely grew in that night's sleep, but I think it was worth it because I learned a lot. And before we started, he also talked about giving a keynote to a lot of nutritionists and RDs who were surprised at a lot of the information in his book. So I know he's going to debunk a lot of things when it comes to protein, um, but we're going to let him get into the education of it and and really how how protein has affected him personally as an athlete to where he is today. So David, thank you so much and welcome to the show. Thank you, Kelly. It is great to be here. Oh, awesome. So let's start with your, your story. You know, it sounds like you were really active and an athlete growing up. How has protein played a role in your health and optimal health? 
Well, when I was when I was uh, thirteen or fourteen years old, I was uh, I was in in scouting, and they took us on a field trip. I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, and and the headquarters for Oscar Mayer Meatpacking Company uh, at that time was in Madison, Wisconsin, and they took us on a field trip there, and we we saw the pigs getting slaughtered. And when I left there, I had this terrible feeling about I, I didn't want to eat meat anymore, and I decided to become a vegetarian, and much to my mother's dismay because much of her, uh, I was one of four children and very strong family and meals and food were very important. And she was a cook and she was a good cook and I didn't want to eat what she was cooking for me. And so she was worried about my health and she would drag me to the doctor probably every six months to make sure I wasn't anemic and I was getting enough iron and all this stuff. So this went on for a long time. And I was a vegetarian for a long time. And in 1982, I started, or a few years before that, I started running marathons. And then 1982, I started doing triathlons. So I was I was exercising a lot. I was working full time in a pediatric practice, and my weekends were in a neonatal intensive care unit. And uh, that went on for about uh, 15 years. And I got injured. I injured my hamstring. And I could not get it to heal. And I pretty much had availability to anything you could get. I had chiropractors and massage therapists and electrical stim and homeopathic injections and you name it, I tried it and I could not get it to heal. If I, if I went out and I went to the track and I tried to push it, I would be sore for days and I was afraid if I really pushed it, I would get, you know, I would tear it. Around the same time, I had a patient come into the office who was an expert in using high-dose enzymes as a cancer therapy. And there had been a book written about this. Uh, the author's name was William Donald Kelly. He, he's a dentist, lived in New York. He had acquired pancreatic cancer. And he'd cured himself using a uh, high dose pancreatic enzymes. And he would be taking like 72 of them a day, 12, six times a day. He did coffee enemas. He did some change in his diet. He was using sauna and his pancreatic cancer went away. And subsequently he counseled, I think 10,000 people by phone on helping them with their cancers. And he had many who got better. When he was elderly, he became kind of, kind of crazy, and but a patient of mine, the couple years before he died, worked with him and had learned his system, and I was seeing her. She had her own medical problems, and she started telling me about this enzyme therapy, and and she told me that you could, you know, if you had pre-cancer or if you had early cancer growing. What you could do is do these enzymes for three days. And if you started to get sick or things happened, it meant that you had a brewing cancer. And then you should do a course of the enzymes to kind of take care of it and nip it in the bud. So she told me about this and I was a self-experimenter and I thought, well, I'll try it. So I took 12 of these very concentrated pancreatic enzymes on an empty stomach one Tuesday morning. And by 11 o'clock, I thought that my stomach had burned a hole in it because the reaction was so severe, just like a severe gastritis. Wow. Enzymes had started to digest my stomach, which is what had happened. Now, a healthy stomach has a nice mucus layer so that the enzymes wouldn't have done anything to it. But mine obviously didn't have it. And I said to her, I don't know what's wrong with me. I really don't think I have cancer, but I can't take these, <laughs> these enzymes. And I just sort of parked it and didn't know what else to do. And then uh, this hamstring came up and I ran into a guy who'd been in Europe and he had a nutritional supplement that had some amino acids in it. And he said, you know, people are using this for sports performance. Why don't you try them? And he gave me a couple bottles and I started taking them. 
And within about probably four to six weeks, I could feel that my body had something going into it. I was still a vegetarian at the time that I had been missing. And my hamstring started to hurt. And I started to go do hard uh, interval workouts. And I really didn't have any trouble. My hamstring healed. And I went to Ironman Canada a few months later, and I had the best time I'd ever had. I also gained about 10 pounds in lean body mass with really no change in outward appearance. My weight was the same. My chest was the same. Didn't look any different. And I talked to one of the guys who had done the experiments on this formulation of amino acids. And he said, as a vegetarian, you're not getting adequate protein. The weight gain that you're, that you're getting is bones, uh, liver, kidney, heart. Your body's actually filling in deficits that have been there for a long time. Wow, that's pretty profound. That was pretty profound. And then I have the idea that, well, maybe the protein deficiency had something to do with my reaction to these enzymes. And so I called her up and I said, send me some more. And she sent me some more. And you're, so I did, I took the 12 on an empty stomach first thing in the morning. I'm supposed to take 12 before lunch, 12 before dinner, 12 before bed, no reaction. Did it for three days, completely fine. And I realized that I had a subclinical protein deficiency, amino acid deficiency. It affected my athletics, it affected my healing, it affected my stomach lining. And the other thing that happened, I was using a heart rate monitor for training, and I knew that my, that my uh, maximum heart rate on test was 172 beats per minute. And I did a retest after this whole thing happened. And I was I gained 12 points in maximal heart rate. I was like 184, between 184 and 186 as a, you know, like like all out on a real hot day going up a big hill, like the most I could do. And that seemed to be so it looked to me like cardiovascular wise, I'd had an improvement also. So I started to use the then I started to use these amino acid tablets in the clinic. And most of the people that I'm seeing, I have some high-end athletes and professionals, but most of the people that we're seeing at LifeWorks are people who have serious chronic illness, chronic fatigue or Lyme or cancer or um, MS or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, you know, uh, things like that, mm -hmm. auto-rheumatoid arthritis. And I started to measure as a part of my routine their serum amino acid levels. And what I found is that almost everybody had deficiencies in their fasting serum amino acid level. And I added the amino acid tablets to their programs. And I found that within about six months, they normalized, but even more than that, they had very big changes in many things, you know, energy and quality and rapidity of hair growth and immune uh, anemias would improve and white blood cell counts. Would and, and, and so it, I got very interested in this and we, we, so we, we started manufacturing the product and out of our company called Body Health. And we have literally thousands of success stories from regular people, from very high-end athletes who really could see objective performance changes or health changes. And since that time, I've measured many, many thousands. On every patient I see, we measure serum amino acids as a part of our panel. And probably 90% of people are deficient. Nearly 100% of vegans or vegetarians are deficient, and they get better when they supplement with essential amino acids, like we call our product Perfect Amino, and it comes as a powder, like a drink, or it comes as tablets. But it, almost everybody who takes it can, can really tell a difference in their overall health. 
And do you have clients in your practice that want to remain plant-based, vegetarian, vegan, and they're taking your perfect amino supplement and, and getting out of that malnourished deficiency state? Yes. Okay. Great. I mean, the, the problems with, with, you know, there's an upside to being, to being vegan, vegan or vegetarian. Uh, if you're doing it organically and you're not, you know, you, you're, you're sort of watching the, the carbohydrate load, but, but, you know, you got to watch B12 and you got to watch iron and you got to watch uh, omega-3 fats. But so I have a lot of patients that are either vegan or vegetarian. And we, so we track that stuff and we make sure that they are supplemented with those things, including amino acids, and then verify that they're, you know, that their blood is reflecting that, yeah, they are getting the nutrients that their body really needs. And I think it's a way to be vegetarian or vegan and actually really be healthy. Right. What I found is that within a couple of years, if you're on a typical vegan or vegetarian diet, you are going to be protein deficient and you are going to be amino acid deficient. You know, there are doctors out there you know, I've, I've interviewed them on the podcast and they say, you know, the most annoying question I get from people is like, where am I getting my protein? You know, and they say that you know, they're talking about the plant-based sources, but you're seeing in clinical practice that fasting serum levels are low. And I'd love for you to go into like what some of the protein deficiency and protein malnourishment, what that can manifest it as in the body and in your regular everyday life, not for people with chronic, chronic, severe issues, but even just, you know, people who feel and, and seem healthy from the outside. Yeah. I mean, I think the most common one is, and, and, and sometimes it's hard to separate out because sometimes people have a mindset or they come in with a mindset of I'm going to be vegan or vegetarian. And it's, you know, it's a philosophical thing for me and, and almost a religious thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm accepting of that. I don't have any, I, I was a vegetarian for 40 years, so I understand. <laughs> but they're tired and their hormone levels are low and they don't actually feel really good. I got so many yoga teachers that are uh, patients of mine and they come in, they're exhausted. You know, they're, they're maybe teaching four or five classes a day. It's very strenuous. Some of them are in, you know, in a, in a, in a hot yoga setting where it makes it even doubly tough and they're, they're vegetarians or they're vegans and they're having a hard time. So they feel better when they get replenished with amino acids because their body then has the things that it needs so that it can, you know, it can work optimally. Right. I'm totally, my orientation for any patient is you, your body is unique, and what it's going to take to make it function at the high level is are the you know you, you will tell me when you feel good, and I will verify it just to make sure with labs to make sure that it's you know we're not sort of whistling through the graveyard. But usually, when people are like, "I I feel great, I feel better than I ever have," then we we get we get the combination right. Yeah. You, you, one of the pages in your book that st- stood out for me was when you listed off what people are going through and symptoms or diagnoses they have and, and stating that they are protein mal- malnourished patients with cancer, autoimmune diseases like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, sleep disorders, people with fibromyalgia, anxiety, depression, dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. I mean, the list seems to go on and on. Can you talk about protein as a building block for life, what it creates and what it builds in our body and how these disease states manifest? Yeah. Um, one of the most interesting, see, I think part of the problem today with this is that unless you are growing your own food and, and animals, if you eat animals, the quality of the food that you get is the food itself is malnourished. The soil is malnourished. There's so much pesticide, so much herbicide put on soil that the basic topsoil is depleted. The the glyphosate, the Roundup, that's put on almost all crops, 5 billion pounds a year in the United States, it damages the root system. 
uh, the roots aren't able to absorb proper minerals. So the, the fruits and vegetables that we eat and the fruits and, and the vegetables and beans and stuff that are, that are fed to animals, they're depleted already. So we have, a, we have a factor that our food is just not what it used to be. And for anybody who's gone over to certain places in Europe and had a tomato or had some lettuce, you can't get lettuce that tastes like that in the U.S. unless you maybe grow it in your backyard and you paid a lot of attention to the soil because it just isn't the same thing. The other part of it is, is that almost everybody has problems with their intestine. They have a leaky gut. They have bad bacteria. They have yeast overgrowth. And in order, and, and many people have heartburny type symptoms or GERD. And what they resort to or what their doctor prescribes for them are medications that block the stomach from being able to produce acid. You know, Pepsid and Zantac and Tagamet and Nexium. These drugs are very powerful. And they make it so that your stomach can't produce acid and you can't digest protein without acid. And you can't absorb minerals, you know, magnesium and zinc and selenium and things like that without adequate stomach acid. And so something like 24 or 28 million prescriptions a month are done by doctors for this. But now all these products are over the counter. So so, you know, a guy had a hoagie and he got heartburn and he started himself on Pepsid and he noticed he felt better. And it's five years later and he's still on it. Mm-hmm. This is a really dangerous thing to do. And so you get a combination of low quality food, intestines that are disordered, because without stomach acid, you eat a salad that's got some bad bacteria or it's got a parasite on it, or the guy in the kitchen dropped it on the floor or he didn't wash his hands after he went to the bathroom and he tossed your salad with his hands and you you get exposed to parasites and funguses and things like that and they go in and your stomach acid is supposed to kill that stuff on the way in but if you don't have any well it's going to it's going to take up residence within you and so the other thing that we find is in addition to low levels of amino acids most people if we do tests on their stool have bad bacteria and they don't have enough good bacteria and they have low pancreatic enzymes. And so you get, you know, again, you get a, the body can't digest it. So it can't absorb it. So it doesn't have it. And then it's a machine and it needs, you know, all these 84 different nutrients in order for it to perform optimally. And you end up with missing, missing ones. And then you have symptoms. So if you, you know, all the neurotransmitters are made out of amino acids. So people who have depression or anxiety or sleeplessness, they have amino acid deficiencies, 100% of them. And I had, a, had an interesting group of patients who came in with a sort of three symptoms. They were exhausted and they couldn't sleep and they were depressed. And all of them were on prescribed medicine for their their stomach upset, for their GERD. And so I measured their levels of amino acids. And all of them are deficient in an essential amino acid, which is called tryptophan. And I had them stop their their uh, acid blocker medicine. And I gave them extra tryptophan as well as the blend of amino acids. Now, the three symptoms of fatigue, well, the major enzyme in the cell that has to do with energy production is called NAD. It's made out of tryptophan. The major sleep hormone is melatonin. It's made out of tryptophan. And the major neurotransmitter, which if it's low, a person is likely to be depressed, is serotonin. They all require tryptophan in order for the body to manufacture them. And this person had a very low serum tryptophan. 
was on acid blockers, and the symptoms all went away when we supplemented them with extra tryptophan. They started to sleep, and their depression got better, and their energy improved. So that's just sort of a subset. Now, this kind of patient could walk in any doctor's office any time and be treated with an antidepressant, mm-hmm. maybe something even like an amphetamine, like Adderall or one of these drugs to give them energy. And then let's give them some kind of pharmaceutical to help them sleep. So now you're on three more medications besides the acid blocker. And now you're going to really screw somebody up because all those medicines have really many, many side effects, which are going to deteriorate health. Where the key was this person needed to be off a medicine and needed to be supplemented with tryptophan, and then their body got better. Wow. So from your standpoint, obviously, I know you recommend uh, supplementing with amino acids, but when it comes to increasing the bioavailability of the amino acids from the food that we're eating, do you recommend digestive enzymes and hydrochloric acid to the majority of your patients or are you testing for it? How does, how does that work? Because I know we all want adequate levels of amino acids in our blood. We actually test for it, you know, because they're coming in here for a professional evaluation. Most people over 40 need acid and most people over 40 need digestive enzymes. Probably 90% of our patients, more than that, 90, I'm going to say 99% of the patients that I see Our first program is a gut program because when we do their stool test, we find not enough good bacteria, a bunch of bad bacteria. If they've been on antibiotics in the last year, they definitely have bad bacteria. They may have yeast overgrowth. Many people have parasites. They don't even know about it. We measure levels of pancreatic enzymes. Many people are low. So a combination of, you know, giving, supplementing them with hydrochloric acid with pancreatic enzymes, with a probiotic, with something to help them heal their gut lining, something like, like used to be called Restore, but it's called Ion now. You know, can really, sometimes they need an, an herbal type uh, antibiotic to get rid of yeast or bad bacteria. Sometimes they need a, an, an herbal type um, or essential oil type antiparasitic. And then they have to get on organic food and then usually within six to eight weeks, they're bloating, heartburn, gas, diarrhea, constipation, bulging stomach, it goes away. And then we supplement them with amino acids. The, the, the amino acids, the, the body has certain tissues which, where the turnover is very high. Like the gut lining, every three or four days, you're growing a new gut lining. But that lining's made out of proteins for the most part. I mean, there's there's essential fats and vitamins and minerals, but if you don't have the protein structure, you can't do it. If you are amino acid deficient, which translates then to not enough protein, your gut lining's not going to turn over every three or four days. It might turn over once a week or every 10 days, which means the membrane then is going to be not completely a barrier against you absorbing things that you shouldn't absorb. This is what leaky gut is. You have a membrane that is allowing things to get in your body that should never get in your body. And once those things get in your body, your body reacts to it. It'll make immune proteins. And all, virtually all autoimmune disease, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis or MS, they have leaky gut. And they are absorbing whole proteins or uh, bacterial cell walls or whole bacteria or parasites into their body. And their body is out with a, a big immune reaction against that stuff. And that immune reaction can cross over to where those, those antibodies actually attack their own tissue. You know, like you eat a steak. Or maybe, you know, the proteins in that are very close to our own. And if those whole proteins are coming across prior to being uh, absorbed, and your body makes an immune attack 
uh, antibody against that protein, there is a very high chance it's going to start reacting against your own muscle tissue or cartilage or brain cells. And then you're going to have an autoimmune condition where your joints hurt or your muscles hurt or your brain, quote unquote, hurts, but that might be depressed or anxious or can't sleep or can't remember, but it's, it originates in the gut. Now, if you have enough essential amino acids, then your tissues can replenish themselves as they need to. So you can have high gut turnover. You can get fast wound healing. You can get, you know, after a hard workout, some people are sore for days and days and days because the muscle has had micro tears and injuries and they don't have enough amino acids to get it fixed. But if you take enough amino acids, usually people within 24 hours, their muscle soreness is, is better and they, they can do another good workout the next day or the day after and they can get gain from their workout. They're not getting broken down from their workout because they're not actually healing the, the injury to what they did the day before. I mean, you definitely made a case for having enough amino acids, but I think we'll I'd love for you to even go further into that. Um, in your book, you talk about amino acid utilization. Um, and this is something I'm really passionate about as well. Just the what, what's really available to you from the foods that you're eating. Can you, can you explain what amino acid utilization is and kind of give some examples with some of the foods that a lot of people are eating and whether they're plant-based or eating animals, what the best sources are? Sure. And this is not taught in school anywhere that I know of. <laughs> and, uh, and so almost nobody knows about it. When you eat a protein, so that could be a soybean or brown rice or an egg or a piece of chicken, something that has a protein in it. And assuming that you have stomach acid and digestive enzymes and an intact intestinal membrane, what happens is that protein, now a protein is made up of smaller units called amino acids. And I think the best analogy is that if you think of an alphabet, like English language alphabet, there's 26 letters. And in order to form words, you can put the letters together in different combinations. Some letters or some words have one letter like A or, or uh, I. And some words have 26 or 30 letters. And I think in the English language, there's something like 400,000 words in the Oxford Big Dictionary. And you can get, you know, many, many combinations of, of, of letters. In the protein alphabet, there's 26 amino or 22 amino acids, which are like the letters. And if you combine the letters in different sequences and different numbers, you get different proteins. Now, roughly in our body, there's about 50,000 different proteins. So that's a lot. But all of them are made up of different combinations of 22 amino acids. Of the 22, there's eight of them which are called essential, which means you've got to get them in your diet because your body can't manufacture them. If you get the eight, your body can make the other 14 to give you the 22. Now, in traditional dietary science, it says that there are actually some people say nine and some people say 10, essentially, mm -hmm. especially at the, for infants or for older people, that they need the extra ones. Uh, experiments have been done, and we duplicated the experiments here in our clinic, where we did a baseline level of serum amino acids. We fed them perfect amino on an empty stomach. And we measured their level, their serum levels of amino acids at 30 and 90 minutes. Now, the textbooks say that histidine and arginine, which are two other amino acids, are essential. 
And what we found when we gave the eight essential that didn't include histidine and arginine, that within 30 minutes, the levels of histidine and arginine in the bloodstream were jacked up so that the body could take the eight and make whatever it needed. So perfect amino is a, is a, is a mixture of the eight essential amino acids, and it is very important at the proportions of them. Uh, so that they can best be utilized. Now, let's. So now I want to just take this sort of backwards. You eat a um, an egg, or a steak, or uh, some pea protein. It comes in as a protein, and it's a long chain. Muscle protein, our muscle protein, our actin, which is one of the muscle proteins in our body, and the, the protein is very similar in a in a cow or a duck or a chicken or a fish, that amino acid chain is, I think, 5,600 amino acids per fiber of muscle. So it's a gigantic chain of amino acids. You can't use that as the chain. Your body can't take that, that piece of muscle fiber and then just insert it into our own muscle. It has to go through the digestive process whereby those 5,600 amino acids get digested, which means the amino acids get chopped up until they're single amino acids, and then they can be absorbed by our intestine. So you take the 5,600, they go through the stomach, the upper intestine, digestive enzymes. Now they're single amino acids. Now they go through the intestinal wall. Now they go into the bloodstream. Now they go to the cells. Now, every different protein has a different mixture of amino acids and different mixtures of how many essential amino acids are in each of those proteins. So a study was done to see what percentage of the amino acids in a certain food actually got utilized by the body so that it could be made into our body protein. And the samples that were used were egg, digested egg proteins, and soy, and dairy, so whey and, and casein. And what they did was the, the difference between an amino acid and a carbohydrate and a fat, all of them have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen as part of their structure. But amino acids or proteins also have added nitrogen. And carbohydrates and, um, and fats don't have nitrogen. So you could have somebody who's fasted. Give them, let's say, a measurable amount. Let's say you gave them 100 grams over a day of soy, let's say 50 grams, okay, more realistic, 50 mm -hmm. grams of soy, 50 gram, another person got 50 grams of egg, another group, this wasn't a single people, this was 30 in each group, single groups of, of, of meat and fish. And on, on 50 grams of protein, about 16% of that protein is nitrogen. So you could say that 16% of 50 is, uh, what is it, eight times, is like, uh, is it eight grams? 50 times 0.16 is eight. Mm -hmm. yeah. So eight grams of nitrogen would be how, how much nitrogen they took in. Now, if they digested the nitrogen, if they digested the proteins, and they utilized all of that nitrogen by making their own body protein, so they made enzymes, and they made liver cells, and they made immune cells, and they made bone cells, if you measure their urine as to how much nitrogen would come out, because if it's not utilized, the nitrogen is going to be excreted, it's going to be 
pushed out as a waste product. So if an amino, if an amino acid goes into a cell and it gets incorporated into a protein, that nitrogen is not going anywhere, it's staying in the body. If that amino acid goes into the cell and the body can't utilize that amino acid, it will cleave off, it will cut off the nitrogen. It will take the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, which is left. Now, that's basically a carb. Mm -hmm. It will burn it or store it. It'll either turn it into fat or it'll store it as glycogen or it'll burn it. And that nitrogen has to be gotten rid of. And that nitrogen goes to the liver. It gets hooked up with a compound into what's called urea. And it goes to the kidney and it gets peed out. That's what's in urine. It's nitrogen waste. Most of the nitrogen waste leaves the body through the urine, a little bit through the stool, a little bit through the sweat. 90 plus percent of it is excreted in the urine. So if we give somebody 50 grams of, of protein, and we know they're taking in eight grams a day of nitrogen, and we do this over a month, and we measure their urine 24 hours a day for a month, and we measure how many grams of nitrogen went in each day and how many grams came out, we can do a nitrogen balance study on this person. And what you will find out is if there's, let's say there's their sole source of amino acids was uh, dairy, about 86% of the nitrogen that goes in comes out. Oh it's my goodness. So you can make an equation, which is nitrogen utilization for dairy is about 16 or 17%. If you look at rice proteins and plant proteins and pea proteins, they're much less than that. And they're less because the mix of amino acids, of essential amino acids, is not favorable for optimum use in humans. Now, that doesn't mean they're bad foods. It doesn't mean that they don't work. But if you're relying on them to keep your body protein needs optimum, you're most likely going to fall short. Mm -hmm. And that's when we measure it. Now, Meat and fish are about 33% utilized. So they're about twice as good as dairy or vegetable proteins. Egg, whole egg, is about 48% utilized. So it's, it's almost the best sort of natural occurring food. Now, if you take the yolk off, some people think egg whites are healthy. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> So you know, methionine is one of the essential amino acids. It is in the yolk. It's not in the white very much. And you drop the egg from 48 down to 16. So eat your eggs with the yolk. Breast milk is about 49%. So it's the optimum food, but it's hard to get. Okay, baby. <laughs> mm -hmm. Measures at 99% net nitrogen utilization. So it's the most, it's the strongest thing anybody ever found. And that's why it's so powerful because it's eight essential amino acids. They're 99% utilized. So when they go in, your body's not turning them in to carbohydrates or to fats. It's making them into protein. Now, wow. one of the interesting things about this is that uh, branch chain amino acids are three of the eight essentials. The net nitrogen utilization of branched chain amino acids is zero because you can't get any protein out of three amino acids. You need all eight. So it's a waste completely for athletes to take branched chain amino acids unless they want an expensive carbohydrate. <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Turn into a carbohydrate. The other thing that's that, you know, the maybe the best marketing ever done short of slim fast which is the largest selling diet product and a horrible mixture of you know crappy uh, fructose corn syrup and 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 dairy proteins but it's the it's the it's it's either the best or among the best products because they have good marketing uh is collagen 
Collagen is missing tryptophan. It's not a complete protein. And uh, I think 40 or 50% of the amino acids that comprise collagen are non-essential amino acids. Proline, hydroxyproline, they're non-essential. So a lot of people are eating a lot of, of collagen thinking that they're, they're really, boy, this is the ultimate thing. Little do they know that it's coming from feathers and leftovers on the bottom of the meat thing from hoofs and things like that, which is where they get it. Very few of the collagen uh, products are or from or animals that are, are, you know, they're organically fed and grass fed and all this stuff. And so a lot of these products are contaminated. They have heavy metals and they have chemicals and they have junk in it. But really, if you measure the net nitrogen utilization of collagen, it's very low. So I, that's, that's sort of a, that's what net nitrogen utilization is. And that's why it's, it's, it's an important concept. So if you're, the average person needs about 30 grams of essential amino acids per day if it's in the mixture of perfect amino for their optimum, you know, so that they're getting enough protein. Now, the, there are a few people who have a gut microbiome which is especially good at converting uh, non-essential amino acids to essential amino acids. And so every now and then you'll find a vegan bodybuilder who truly is one who's got big muscles or shows high sports performance or is doing really well. I forgot the guy that um, that started the Vega. Vega's a... a um... Brandon. Yeah, Brandon. Now, I haven't measured him and I don't know his thing, but I'm just assuming he was a very good triathlete and maybe very healthy and eating a plant-based diet. And he may be one of these people who just has a very unique microbiome where they are, his microbiome is able, like a cow, like cows eat grass. Now, grass is not high protein food, but they have five stomachs or however many they have. And they are able to manufacture the amino acids that they need to, you know, to turn up, to, to create an 800 pound bull. So it is possible in the human that this can work. In my experience, those people with that kind of gut health are really rare, but it can happen. So that would be another. So if you're one of those people where I'm plant-based, I'm strong, my amino acids are great, I'm doing good, bravo for you because your body's really working well. Most people, uh, like probably 95%, don't have that microbiome. And they're gonna, they're likely to be deficient or they're underperforming for what they could be if they got all the things that they needed in terms of, of essential amino acids. I really feel like mostly people should be eating real food. Mm -hmm. Amino acids should be a supplement. So if you're paleo or if you're keto or if you're vegan, that you eat whole good foods. But even with that, most people need to supplement with amino acids and essential fatty acids and vitamin D because the levels are low and, and they're just not getting it from their, from the food that they eat. Uh, the best way to find out for any individual person is um, there is a panel, there's a, there, uh, Genova is a very well-known uh, laboratory that does this kind of testing. And the test that I like the best to look at amino acids and essential fatty acids and vitamins and minerals is their test called an ion panel. It's I-O-N. Yeah. And not cheap, but it's really worth the money. And you will find out. You do it, you do the panel. You also get organic acids so you can see what your gut bacteria are doing. And they give, and the organic acids also tell you how your energy pathways are and your fatty acid pathways and um homocysteine and uh, they just uh, and 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 saturated fats. I mean, it gives you a lot of stuff. And it's, um, I, I just, I do that 
test on every person too, because you just find out and you, you turn the, you know, you show them the lab and you say, look, out of the eight essential amino acids, you have five of them that are barely on the chart. And they should be at this level and you don't have them. Okay. Put you on perfect amino, you know, take two scoops. If they're really deficient, I'll say take two scoops twice a day. And in six months, let's relook at your amino acids. In the meantime, you are going to feel a difference. And it works. They get, they get, you know, we're going to fix up your gut and they're going to be better. Now, Genova makes another test called SpectraCell, mm-hmm. which people go to their lab. I don't like the test. I think it doesn't give results that reflect what happens to a body. So the same lab does both. Many doctors do SpectraCell because insurance covers it, but I don't find that the results of it are that help me clinically to get the patient in the best shape. So I don't recommend that. It's interesting because I work with a number of functional MDs that use a lot of Genova testing. I've used the ion panel. I've used the organic acids panel. It's, um, but it's funny. These are the same, these are the same people that are recommending bone broth, gelatin, collagen for gut health and healing. I'm curious what your take is on bone broth and things like that. Well, bone broth has some collagen and probably some other proteins in it. It's a very low protein food because it's mostly water. Mm-hmm. There are some beneficial minerals in it. So I think it's I think it's healthy if the again, where did it come from? If you make your own bone broth, you have organic chicken or organic uh or you know, grass fed, blah, 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 uh, beef bones, you know, big bones, and you and you and you make your own bone broth. Well, I think that's a. I think it's a very good food. Is it a high protein food? No. Is it enough protein? You know, if you're doing a fast and you're doing bone broth, will it get you through for one to five days? Sure. But if you're relying on that, unless you're throwing some of the meat in with it, as a good source of protein, it just isn't. There just isn't very much protein. Right. Well, let's go, let's go into a couple of the protein deficiencies that you've seen specific to women, since I have a very big um, female audience and I want to make sure not only am I and my, my family members getting enough protein, but I really want, you know, this is, this is a place for me to learn from experts like you and to offer better solutions to my audience as well. So um, there were a couple of chapters that really stood out to me in your book, um, specifically when it came to females, thyroid health. Um, I'd love for you to touch on um, on like thyroid health and weight-related issues for protein deficiency and why those diagnoses might be made with protein deficiency. Okay. Um, thyroid hormone is made out of amino acid called tyrosine. And if you add iodine... Um, three iodines or four iodines to tyrosine, what you get is thyroid hormone. Uh, In order for the thyroid to manufacture it, it also needs a bunch of other minerals, uh, magnesium and zinc and selenium and vitamin C. Uh, So uh, you have to, at minimum, have enough tyrosine and have enough iodine. I did. I used to do iodine challenge tests on people uh, to see if they had sufficient iodine. And 495 out of 500 people had iodine deficiency. And so I stopped doing the test because it was $500 and it just seemed like a waste. Let's just put everybody on some iodine or have a medial seaweed three four. Um, because iodine deficiency is very, uh, very common uh, in Americans. Uh, in Japanese, where they eat a lot of uh, of nori or or um, pl- those type foods, they they don't have deficiencies. Um, on your essential amino acid panel, many many people who are hypothyroid, the the non essential tyrosine is a non essential amino acid. It's made out of an essential amino acid called phenylalanine. So many people who have low thyroid. When I look on their amino acid panel, they have very low tyrosine. And their hypothyroidism might be just an essential, just an amino acid deficiency 
Uh, and if they got tyrosine replenished and iodine replenished and then the other minerals that are needed, their thyroids might actually start working. And I've seen this in people where they come in, they're, they test hypothyroid, um, they have low tyrosine, they have low iodine, they have low zinc, and I will put them on a desiccated thyroid to get them started, which is ground up animal thyroid gland, and uh, then give them amino acids, essential amino acids, and uh, iodine. And we work them up to a level of their thyroid, let's say after three, four weeks, where their thyroid is now in good range and they're not cold anymore and their dry skin goes away and their hair stops falling out and their weight, and their, you know, they lose weight and their energy improves and they're cruising. And then four or five months later, I have given them a sheet that says, if you're getting too much thyroid, you know, you're going to feel like you drank too many cups of coffee. You're going to feel hyper. You may have palpitations. You may have trouble with sleep, which means that you're on too much thyroid. And they'll call and they say, I think I'm on too much thyroid. Okay, good. Let's start to reduce the amount of thyroid that we're adding. And sometimes it reduces down to zero because their thyroid actually could work if they had the nutrients that it needed to make thyroid. Now, sometimes we get all the way to no thyroid uh, hormone supplementation, and, and sometimes uh, we get to like 50% where the thyroid actually does need some help. So that would be a real, like a, a very common thing that I would see where their thyroid is low. And just for your audience, many, many people, the, the normal, regular family doctor and the regular endocrinologist act as if the normals on the lab core sheet or the usual screening test for thyroid uh, actually mean something. You know, like the TSH, which is the, the, it's the hormone that the pituitary gland makes that tells the thyroid to make more. And that is the usual screening test for most doctors for thyroid. Mm -hmm. Level in my lab goes from 0.5 to 4.5. And if you're in that range, most likely the doctor is going to say, you know, your it's not your thyroid. You're cold and you're fat and you have no energy and your skin is dry, <coughs> but it's not your thyroid. Even though your mother had thyroid and your grandmother had thyroid, and your sister had thyroid, the level goes from 0.5 to 4.5 and yours is at the high end of normal 4.5 and you're okay. And really that is uh, the, the normals they get are really the averages of the last, say, 100,000 people that went into the laboratory and they tested them. And what they found that they got a bell curve and it went from 0.5 to 4.5 and they took 5% off the bottom and 5% off the top and they said, this is a normal range. But if anyone listening remembers the last time you went to the lab to get, to get a blood drawn, did they screen you at all? For what medications were you on? How is your overall health? Do you have a, um, a serious medical condition? Are you being treated for anything? And the answer is they don't screen at all. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to get an indication of your thyroid from, the, from all the people who went in and got the test, and none of them are healthy, or very few of them. So what you want is an optimum level for healthy people, which is at the top end for most people. So right. what we do is monitor people till we get them to a point where they, their physiology is really working. They don't have cold hands anymore and their energy is better. And they can now add, you know, three numbers together in their head and they, and it, and they don't have to write it down on paper because they're like, they, they can't think straight. And they don't have to have a, always a sweater when they go to the mall because they're always freezing. And, you know, on and on with the symptoms, the, the, their heavy periods stop going away. And, you know, they just, and they have energy. Um, and 
you know, it's funny because if we want to, if, if I want to get a seminar in a health food store or a library to fill up, all we have to put on the, on the title of the lecture is, um, if you think you're hypothyroid, <laughs> your doctor says no, come get the truth. There'll be 200 people there. Yeah. And those people respond to thyroid and it, it's easy, it's super safe, and it changes their life. Wow, that's great. Yeah. That is great. You know, it is, it's reassuring just to have a perspective that I've really never heard before. <laughs> if I'm being honest, I mean, I've heard of protein deficiency. Uh, I see protein deficiency in clients as a lack of energy and, you know, I can see brittle nails and breaking hair. Um, but you go into so many other disease states that it makes perfect sense because when you go back to the biology and the science of it, and how, how it is such a building block for so many things in the body from our cells to our neurotransmitters and our hormones, of course, it's going to affect so much more than we can ever imagine. So, gosh, I'm just, I'm really thankful for your time. And I'm really thankful for you educating me, um, not only in your book, but today. And um, I'm excited to share this information with people because there has to be people, people out there that are going to benefit from it. Thank you. That's, that's my job. I'm glad it's working. Yeah. I, it's, it's, so, it's so fun to have people understand this and then apply it to themselves, and it really changes their life. And normal medical practice is so, so sort of separated from health and health restoration that you don't really get this when you go to your average doctor. Now, if it's a chiropractor who's nutritionally oriented, he gets it, or a naturopath, or some osteopaths. And there are some of us that are MDs. But 99%, you know, it's a diseased sort of oriented system, and it's, it doesn't really make the mark, and it actually can harm a lot of people. And the restoration is actually kind of simple when you just break it down to you need to have certain nutrients in your body for it to function well. And if you put those in, you can do a lot better. And then at the same time, if you avoid toxic influences, like you're careful with your personal care products and plastics exposures and EMF, you take that load kind of off the body, um, you can really make a difference in, in how you feel and, and your overall quality of life. Absolutely. So true. Well, I'm, I'm on board with all of the, of cleaning out my medicine cabinet, my clean beauty. I have, you know, all of the subscriptions to clean proteins and CSA boxes of clean vegetables. And I'm, I'm lucky to have that. But this added layer of, of information that I haven't heard from what I would say is some of the best functional MDs in California and, and in New York. It's, it's, it's just really refreshing information and I love continually learning. So I really appreciate your time. I know everyone's going to love it too. Where can people follow along with you? Um, the clinic, if, if, if patients are interested in seeing me personally, it's LifeWorks. It's one word, wellnesscenter.com. Uh, we have a very big website, so you can log on there and see kind of what we do and our approach. Um, we probably have more modalities for diagnosis and treatment than any other clinic I know of, and I know most of the active guys in the in the country, you know, from ozone to hyperbaric oxygen to pulse magnetic field and all kinds of IV therapies. Um, our nutrition company is called Body Health, so it's Body Health. Dot com. Uh, we make about 25 different nutritional supplements. They're very high quality. Uh, Perfect Amino is one of the main ones, but we have things for performance, for detoxification, digestive enzymes, uh, vitamins, minerals. And uh, that website also has a lot of information. Um, we're on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, 
I do a newsletter every week, which is um, free. And if you log into the websites, you can subscribe to the newsletter and uh, kind of see what I'm thinking and uh, sort of hear successes from either patients or people using the products or ideas for you to improve your own health. Well, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be signing up for that newsletter right now. <laughs> called Optimum Health Report, and the other one is called Body Fitness Newsletter. And the, on the website, you can sign up for it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Minkoff. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. I'm wish, wishing you all the best. Um, before we end every show, we ask one question, and what is? And that question is, what does body love mean to you? Body love. <laughs> well, I think it's it's understanding that if you want to feel good and and be able to put your attention on what your life purposes are and not on your own body condition or problems, that you treat your body in a way that will allow it to do it. So if you, if you have a Ferrari, you don't put 87 octane gas in it. You put nine, you know, you know, you put a hundred octane gas in it. So what you eat and sunshine and sleep and supplementation and food uh, and relationships and, and figuring out why you're here and what you're supposed to be doing. Um, that's my sort of all encompassing. Uh, and when I'm doing that, I'm, my body love is in. <laughs> I love it. Taking positive action steps so that to love your body so that you can be the best person and vehicle for change and whatever you're passionate about. Really awesome. So, so cool. Well, thank you so much for being here. And I will keep you posted when this goes live. I'll reach back out to your publicist. But I really do appreciate the book. It was eye-opening for me and um, in certain ways. Um, and I think it's going to be really beneficial to my audience. So I really appreciate it. Awesome. Love talking to you. Thanks. You're very good at this. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs> I really enjoyed the book. So have a good day, David, and um, we'll talk soon. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at bewellbykelly.com and follow me on Instagram at bewellbykelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers. 